Last year, I served as the first student government president in 10 years at Bryant University. With that title came a set of unspoken pressure to set a positive expectation for what women can achieve at a school that has historically seen leadership as male-centric. I'll never forget the first time I learned about the lack of women Nobel laureates. It became clear that there wasn't a lack of successful women interested in STEM, but instead a lack of structural change that has hindered the ability of women to attain success at the same rate as men. Using the Nobel Prize organization as my measure, my talk will tap into historic barriers to entry for women in STEM, which has resulted in recognition and reward gaps at later phases of their career. It's important to note that many researchers have identified that some of these gaps in STEM are closing, but my talk delves into a broader understanding of how we got to where we are in the first place. In order to understand the full cycle of what a woman in STEM experiences, it's important to begin at the early stages of development when gender socialization begins to segregate opportunities for young boys and girls. This is something called the leaky pipeline, where women begin gravitating away from STEM at different phases of their careers. However, in order for us to understand the leaky pipeline, we have to understand how female and male gender roles and stereotypes act different for boys and girls. Girls are steered to be communally oriented with a focus on interpersonal skills and relationship development, while boys are steered to be autonomous, acquire skills and competence, and get involved in activities that aim at problem solving, power and status, and financial gain. How many people have heard the stereotype that girls aren't good at math or don't like science? Yep, a few people in the audience. Well, both men and women hold these viewpoints. However, researchers have disputed them. A professor of ethics named Mary Feeney at the University of Arizona said that studies show that girls and women avoid STEM education not because of their cognitive inability, but because of early exposure and experience with STEM. This is further emphasized by a Microsoft study that showed that if girls even have one female role model to look up to and inspire them, that their interest in STEM fields nearly doubled. In the United States, girls are not socialized or taught that they're born with brilliance when men, while men are. That means that when kids are younger, they understand these stereotypes, internalize these stereotypes, before test performance differences can be identified. Another factor that widens the interest, of, uh, ga that widens, widens the interest gap in STEM is parental and peer influence. Parents influence their kids in a variety of ways, through advice, resources available like toys, and access to and exposure to activities and resources. Parents who believe their children are good at a particular STEM subject and support their competencies predict a higher performance um, in the class for that child. However, if parents believe that their child is not good at a particular STEM subject and don't enforce support, there is a negative correlation to the child's performance in the classroom. In a 2017 study, uh, researchers sought to understand how peers could be a source of both exclusionary and inclusionary messages in the classroom. What they discovered was higher exposure to eighth grade male peers displaying explicit STEM or gender bias negatively predicted girls' futures intentions to pursue STEM careers. However, on the flip side, uh, exposure to higher confident female peers in the science classroom positively predicted girls' future intentions. Mothers more than fathers apply gender stereotypes to math and science. However, what's funny is that young adolescent girls look to their mothers for motivation to pursue STEM careers. A study done by the Royal Society of Chemistry in London in 2006 sought to see how these stereotypes kind of penetrate into the university experience. In a focus group of women doctoral students, they found in their first year at the university, 70% of women indicated that they planned a career in research. However, when revisiting that same focus group three years later, only 37% were found to be pursuing the same degree. Researchers have attributed this to, again, the lack of female role models and mentors available for women throughout their academic careers, which leads to lower self-confidence in women doctoral students and less job security in comparison to male peers. Even with comparable age, experience, and publications, studies have shown that men were found to be two and a half times more likely to come up to the full rank of professor compared to female peers. This leads us to the prestige gap, which found that men are overrepresented in elite PhD programs. One of the number one factors for this is that women self-select out for three main reasons. They perceive their abilities to be inadequate compared to their male peers, the environment of the program is unfriendly or unsupportive to women, and there's a culture of fear, fear of failure that disproportionately affects women in STEM compared to men. 
Since 1975, there's been a 13% increase in the amount of women who are getting PhDs in physics. However, when we tie in the Nobel Prize organization, we know that a number of these people who are winning Nobel Prizes are getting awarded for work early on in their careers, when now they're senior scientists working at elite academic institutions. Knowing the barriers to entry that push women out of STEM before they reach senior status may factor in to see who is important enough to win a Nobel Prize. UNESCO found that only 30% of the world's researchers are women, and this matters because even though universities are getting increasingly diverse faculty and staff, there are still barriers in the promotion process. Specifically, there are fewer tenure-track positions filled by women and men, which essentially means that they're, they're not equally represented at the university level. Women's untapped human capital could enhance the STEM workforce, given that they are 50% of the American population and more than 50% of its college-bound population. However, still, a 2010 study found that only 18% of engineering and science workforce was comprised of white women, and that gap gets even wider for black and Hispanic men and women who make up less than 4% each. This needs to be tied back to why women struggle to enroll in PhD programs, which is where this divergence occurs. There was a reluctance of some faculty to mentor women candidates because they're more likely to leave the program to start a family, but this has been disputed by researchers because if adequate resources and accommodations were provided to women to have a proper work-life balance, they could have a career and a family at the same time. This brings up the question of public versus private sphere. There was a period of time where women could not attend US universities unless they were students or teachers, and their primary duty was to stay home, handle family and household duties, while men were able to participate in the public sphere and get access to better life and work opportunities. This perpetuated inequalities for women because a lot of scientific knowledge comes from research organized in the public sphere, and knowing that women were confined to the private sphere, they weren't able to have that knowledge, and instead, they weren't valued the same as men. This brings up the question of respect and appreciation when looking at men and women. When we talk about male scientists and experts, we're more likely to use their surnames, where with women, we're more likely to use their first names. This matters because in a research study done, when people are analyzing two candidates, specifically men and women, people view uh, somebody with their surname as 14% more deserving of a career award compared to those who use first names. Women are more likely to be seen or judged based on their physical appearance and personal information information compared to men, and women's research takes twice as long to move through the review process, and they have to score two and a half times higher on an index of publication report to be judged the same as men. How many people have heard that the gender gap is closing because the number of women entering STEM is higher? A few people? Well, that, necessarily, that isn't necessarily true, because the number of men entering STEM is also increasing, which means that the number of men and women entering hasn't really changed much at all. This matters when we look at pay and equity, because one year post-graduation from a STEM degree, men and women make about the same amount, but these gaps come 10 to 15 years down the line, when men earn about 10% more on average than women. However, I want to bring it back really quick to the subconscious gender bias that we see, um, because this is really where the root structural issue is in terms of the Nobel Prize fielding process. In a study done on 100 professors in STEM-related fields at six U.S. universities, they provided them two made-up cover letters with one female candidate and one male candidate for the same role as laboratory manager. Despite having the same credentials, the professors agreed to pay Jennifer, the female candidate, 4,000 less per year and showed more willingness to mentor John, the male candidate, despite having the same credentials, like I said. And this showed a subconscious gender bias in both male and, faculty, male and female faculty members, which brings us to the discrepancy in the Nobel Prize. With 96% probability there is a bias against women for winning Nobel Prizes, which essentially means that even if women avoid the leaky pipeline, they still do not have equal opportunity to win Nobel Prizes. And this divergence occurs way early on in women's careers when gender socialization are most important. In a recent study, both male and female college students failed to list any women scientists or any women Nobel laureates. And you know what? That pretty much makes sense, because from 1901 to 2020, 934 Nobel Prizes have been awarded, and 876 have gone to men, and only 58 have gone to women. 
of that 58, would it really be my TED Talk if I didn't feature my favorite scientist, which is Madame Curie. She was the first woman ever to win a Nobel Prize and the only person ever to win two. However, the French Academy of Science didn't include her name in the initial nomination, and her husband, Pierre Curie, had to write a letter to the French Academy of Science to get her included. It took 60 years later for a former student of Marie Curie to become the first woman elected to the French Academy of Science. Let's take a closer look at what makes up these academies around the world in terms of representation. A study on 63 academies found that on average, they're comprised of about 12% women, and the French Academy of Science that denied Madame Curie her initial nomination is comprised of under 8% women. The Royal Swedish Academy of Scientists that picks the STEM Nobel Prize winners has under 13% women representing it. And in 2018, for three STEM-related fields in physics, chemistry, and medicine, of the committees that were comprised of six members, five of them were men. How many people have heard of Francis Crick or James Watson? A few people, yes. So they are the, Nobel, the joint Nobel Prize winners for finding the structure of DNA. But what most people don't know is that none of this would have been possible without Rosalind Franklin, who did the data collection for their research. However, her data was shared without her consent, and she was never nominated for the Nobel Prize. This is something called the masking effect, and it happens all the time. It's the idea that work by women remains shielded by their husbands or by other male colleagues who are represented in the field. The Matilda effect, which is attributing women's accomplishments to men, we see all the time in the implicit bias of citations and how we view or compare women against men because women's, uh, women's value is most likely to be attributed to another male that they worked with on the same project. As of 2018, all but four Nobel Prizes awarded to women scientists were shared with men, which, make us, which brings up the most amazing point of all, which is we, are not, we cannot change the Nobel Prize process or the bias within it unless we change the structure. So, I have two call-outs for the statutes governing the Nobel Prize. Number one, it's that nominations and deliberations are held secret for 50 years. This means in the 1970s or 80s, we don't know what factors were used to compare men and women or what bias was used so that we can correct it now. Furthermore, there are three winners in each category, which perpetuates the great man theory of science, which kind of makes sense since 97% of, no of STEM Nobel Prize winners have been men. However, science is not an individual field, and due recognition should be given to all contributors. If there's a Nobel Prize discovery that had 1,000 scientists on it, how come men are winning over and over again when women and men play, play equally into the discovery? The process of closing the gender gap in the Nobel Prize process must be actively tackled and owned by the entire scientific community globally and by both men and women. There must be an active push to revisit the fielding process for Nobel Prize candidates, and we must proactively nominate women to be Nobel laureates. We've made a lot of progress, but we still have a long way to go. My talk here did not reinvent the wheel, but instead it relied on a lot of research from researchers all over the world to bring the narrative in front of you, to bring the narrative I did in front of you today. There's a lot of women waiting, and rightfully so, for a chance to be recognized. But the question is, are we going to help them break those barriers? Thank you for coming to my TED Talk.